I don't know. Like, I, that's a great question because I'm still trying to figure it out. So this project is ongoing since 2010, actually. And one of the things I'm trying to figure out is the relation between, like, one's personal experience of um, singleness and feeling like, I want to date somebody and being alone. Not talking about me. It's an autobiofiction, y'all. It's about somebody. Um, so on the one hand, wanting to like be in relationship, but also experiencing these very intense modalities of sociality that are actually, it seems to me, more urgent than the sort of interpersonal, individual sort of relationship, right? And so I think one of the things that's being interrogated is A's or the main character's own sense of what it means to be alone and lonely. That what he's actually trying to discover is I keep saying these things that I'm feeling about my own sort of personhood as alone and yet I keep elaborating all of these ideas of sociality as having the capacity for transforming the world and even though a and Moth aren't dating in this particular instance, they still inhabit the world by producing a certain kind of relation one to another, such that even like the concept of loneliness doesn't work in that relation either. And so I think one of the things that I'm thinking through and trying to interrogate is what is the concept of loneliness actually doing? And perhaps loneliness and aloneness don't actually get at the, the, the sort of relation that the main character is seeking, and yet the main character is experiencing so many glimpses of what is possible in terms of transformative relation by going to the church, by watching people in the bodega, by listening to Steve Reich, that these things seem to be so mutually um, constitutive for him um, that he doesn't know what aloneness or loneliness actually means anymore, but he knows that he wants to date this person deeply. Again, it's fiction, y'all. Um, other questions? Thank you, though. I mean, so my, my work is deeply black Pentecostal. I grew up black Pentecostal. I, in, a, in a different version of me, I would be like a pastor of a church right now. That was, that was the, that was, yeah, I'm a, I'm a PK, I'm a, I was a, a pastor. And um, I was on the path, right? I was preaching and then kind of stopped. Can't be queer, do that, right? So, um, so the way that I think just relation in general emerges from so there are, there are a whole lot of other letters that I didn't get a chance to read. Obviously, it's t too long. But one of the letters actually talks about um, how the experience of loneliness was first experienced in the church, right? That his, that his queerness was in his deep, intense desire for salvation and his deep desire for conversion and his deep desire for being healed of his sexuality, right? That that actually produced the occasion for loneliness in ways that haven't gone away once he left the church. And so that there is actually, that one can experience these sort of affective registers and affective moves in both kinds of inhabitations, that one can experience a sort of deep sociality and one can experience a sort of deep disconnection. And that what, what the Lonely Letters is trying to do is actually think about that relation, that what is the relation between renunciation um, and the sing singular, what is the relationship between like aloneness and sociality that that A is really just trying to figure out what these things are and he first experienced a lot of this both deep deep connection to everything that is and also deep deep sort of dispossession and displacement from everything that is through his inhabitation of the Pentecostal church right that that it was the noise of the Pentecostal church that kind of gave him protective covering but also the sort of the doctrine and the theology of the church that hurt his feelings and so like this is why talking about feeling is important not just because it's not because the black church or black Pentecostalism is anti-intellectual, but because it's actually thinking through a different kind of epistemological register. And so for me, that that is sort of the the focus of the work is trying to figure that out. I haven't, you know, I'm still trying to figure out, like, you still feel very moved by this music. You're agnostic. Um, what does one do with feeling moved by deeply the music? And not just, like, music with lyrical content, but music that doesn't have lyrical content, how can one be so moved by that but also have experienced deep dispossession in these same places? There is a relation, and so the, the letters are actually trying to use loneliness as like a word that is familiar, probably also to defamiliarize that actual concept that 
And then someone, I presented this somewhere else, and someone came up to me and said, well, you know, the loneliest people are the ones in relationships. And I was like, that's, you know, I hear you, and yet, you have the benefit of saying that, like, as someone in a so-called relationship, and, you know, someone that gets tax breaks because y'all are two people, you know, like, you have two incomes, like, you know, on a material level, too, right, that... You know, I'm not looking for someone to, you know, pair up with my income. And yet, you know, but these are things that sort of get, um, it, it, it easily becomes a way to, like, not actually take seriously the depth of emotion that this person is actually feeling. But what he's also elaborating is, I felt something with you, and we have something. And so even calling that loneliness doesn't actually name it precisely. And so it's, it's, it's really trying to, like, mess with a lot of these concepts, but also trying to use them because they actually get us somewhere in terms of the way we kind of normatively conceive our worlds. Does that help? Thank you. Yes. I mean, I think social media, or there is a tendency to dismiss social media as like not a real thing, which I don't know, I just find it kind of ridiculous. Um, my best friend and I were texting each other yesterday and talking to each other on Twitter and talking to each other on Instagram at the very same time. Three different conversations. Because we're ridiculous, right? But, like, you know, social media has helped um, cultivate relationships. I think I'm here now because of social media, like, because of things like Facebook, that it actually has the capacity to connect us, right? And so I think one of the things we have to actually recalibrate is our idea of what connection is and what connection is possible. That, you know, j someone had said something, and I wrote a response, oh, yeah, someone had said something on Twitter that I had to unfollow them last week. But they said something that I thought was kind of ridiculous, and my response was, you know, quills and ink were also modes of communication, right? That that this idea that social media has created the capacity to interact with people is silly. What one does with the capacity to interact is what one does with it. And so one can experience loneliness, right? But one can also f experience this sort of deep sense of connection. One can make friends. One can, well, I think what it does is it allows us the capacity to um, increase or augment our um, relations with one another. It doesn't have to be the stand-in for it, but it does become an occasion to actually rethink, like, our relation. I'm writing another project about the Hammond B3 organ, um, and I write about how musicians in Brooklyn have a different style of playing the same song than musicians in Chicago, than musicians in the Bay Area, than musicians in Houston, than musicians in, in New Orleans. They use different chord changes, they use different lit motif. Like, you're playing the same song differently, right? But, you know, at one time you could call it, this is the Brooklyn sound and this is the Chicago sound. But with YouTube and people learning from folks in Brooklyn who live in Houston, like what is the local now that digital exists, right? It doesn't mean that the local doesn't exist anymore. It means that the very concept of the local has always been this thing that's been about multiple kinds of sharing that have been mediated by technologies. And so this becomes another way to mediate, like, and I wonder if one day it would be like, you have the YouTube sound of playing an organ. I hope not. But like um, to answer your question, I just I think that it's possible, and I understand. I live in Los Angeles, California. <clears throat> People that know me know that I hate living in, in Los Angeles. Like it's, it's not a joke. I never dislike living somewhere so much because I feel a deep sense of disconnection from like my people and social media has been a thing that has helped me remain somewhat like on the level um, because without it um, I would not have the kinds of conversations I do have and so I think we have to take that just as seriously. Yes. trying to figure out how to move through it, literally, move, movement. Um, I think that one of the things that I've been um, trying to consider is the, the fact that stillness does not exist, um, that everything vibrates, right? That everything, that the very thing that we call inanimate is produced by a certain way to think relation to objects. And if one realized that on a, on a quantum scale, right, everything is movement, then it actually forces me to rethink what it means to, to live, to exist, and what it means to have relation with one another. And so one of the things I'm, I'm trying to think about sort of 
by on the one hand thinking about the quantum scale with regards to human or like the creaturely world is also to think about our relation to the universe that we are also like quantum scale with relation to the things that exist in the mysterious beyond you know land before time you know i don't really remember anything about that movie except the concept of the mysterious beyond i think it's kind of amazing and like there's this mysterious beyond that you know we've only discovered five percent of what's out there right and so we are just as small and so one of the things i'm trying to think about is that if we are if we are moving, if, if we are constantly sort of engaged in this process of vibration, then what does that mean and how does that model for us a way to be together? How is Western sort of um, theology and Western philosophy and Western history predicated upon the renunciation of the ongoing fact of our vibration? That what it, what it tries to do is to still us. And it does this through stealing, it does this through land dispossession, it does this through genocide, that this is what Western thought is, is the constant imposition against sociality, which is movement or vibration. It's the constant imposition against vibration, which is, you know, like, and so what it seems to me is that we have to rediscover what we already were. And by thinking about vibration, you know, science can verify the thing that we've, the things that we have trained out of ourselves, right? That quantum physics is not the first area to think that there's an invisible world. There are things that are happening in front of me right now that I can't see. Quantum physics is catching up with indigenous knowledge and black knowledge and, and minoritized knowledges, right? And so for me, thinking about vibration and the thing and the ways things vibrate in the world just becomes another another way to say that we have to actually shift our epistemological frame to think. Um, our relation radically differently than what we are trained to, te to, to think in terms of relation, in terms of personhood, in terms of object, um, in terms of subject, that all of these things actually have to be reoriented if we take seriously the fact that this thing is vibrating, the fact that I'm vibrating, the fact that my, like everything is vibrating, and what then do, what then do we do, how then do we live, and I think that I would say that there's not an ethical thing. I would say that there's an anethical force. And I would say that's A-N and then the word ethical. Um, in the book, I talk about the problem of history and the problem of theology and the problem of philosophy by talking about a theology, a philosophy, a theology, um, a, his a historical. Because what I'm trying to do is to really think about the relation between the concept of theology, but how. Um, minoritized knowledges and minoritized practices and minoritized performances actually produ produce the disruption against the normative Western concepts of theology, philosophy, history, for example. But then it would also then require a disruption of the concept of the ethical. That the ethical um, in Western thought kind of requires ethical being and a subject that can be ethical. And if you know black folks and indigenous folks and queer folks sort of exist outside the concept of the human, then how can you produce the concept of ethical? I think that vibration also also allows us to actually think about um, the constitution of other other modes, modalities of behavior that can also be about the production of justice. There was a letter that I took out early this morning, which was specifically about the ethical, because um, I feel like I read too long. But yet, yeah, um, vibration is helping me think about that too. So I hope y'all buy the book when it comes out, whatever day that is. Yes. Um. Thank you for both of those. I'll, I'll work backwards. I think that um, by talk, talking about astonishment, what I'm trying to do is get at the, the question of the sublime. Um, but I think about astonishment because um, reading Equiano and Equiano is constantly sort of astonished by things that are happening, both when he's in transit and then when he's like talking to Europeans, he's constantly astonished. And so astonishment for me is a way to think about the, the concept of the, of the sublime, of, of of this sort of interruption of normative understandings of space time without actually relying upon Kantian um, aesthetic sort of, or sort of the transcendental aesthetic in order to do that. Because in the book, there's this very, you know, I was doing the copy edits for the book and it was the first time I've read the entire thing in like a week. Um, normally it's like a chapter, then you take months off and another chapter. And I was reading this long section on Kant, and I was like, what is the point? Me, I would say. Because I, I just didn't understand the point. But then there, the, the point of the Kant section is to really elaborate how Kant's thought is literally racial hierarchy, hierarchy that, that 
what he is constantly doing in terms of talking about enlightenment is man's mm-hmm. escape from self incurred minority. It's really, it's, he said that enlightenment is man's ability to think on his own, right? To, to leave the noise of the world in order to think oneself. And so I want to think about the same sort of concept of the sublime, but in ways that don't necessitate the sort of Kantian transcendental aesthetic in order to do that. And so astonishment is a word that I sort of latched on to in order to sort of think about that, um, the relationship of our bigness, our smallness, and yes. Um, in terms of the relationship between loneliness and solitude, I think that by thinking about um, vibration, it actually helps to also re- to, to think that solitude is also a kind of noise, right? That if one is existing, like we know this on a sort of like physical level, if you are sitting in a room or in a carol at the library and you have on your headphones or you don't, and you're typing that the computer is making noise, that there's a hum and a buzz and a click, that there are things that, that there's noise that is happening there too, but then there's like the noise of your heart and the noise of your breath that all of these things actually disrupt the concept of, of, for me, even solitude. That solitude, perhaps, is a certain kind of quality of, um, a certain quality of affective relationship, maybe. Um, don't quote me on it, because I'm not sure yet. Um, but I think that that loneliness is, is sort of generally taken to be a negative thing. Um, solitude is not thought of in the same sort of um, moral um, universe um, as, a, as a certain kind of negativity. Um, it's, it's, you know, these monks wanted solitude, right? It's the desire that they sort of went after. And, but I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, that kind of solitude is a certain kind of loneliness too, or maybe loneliness. So like, I'm trying to think through that, that distinction too. Yes, yes. So that's that's cool. Uh, an, an, an other that can be imagined in the future. Um, kind of like when he sees the smile and he's like, this isn't recorded, right, y'all? This yeah. isn't recorded. Um, you know, you see the smile and it's like, yes. There's an imagination of of what is to come, right, as, as actually having happened already. Um, I guess for me, in terms of self-fashioning, um, self-creation, <laughs> One of the things I'm, I'm actually arguing or contending against or really um, trying to interrogate is the concept of the self, right? That um, the self as a thing that actually exists, um, as like the stable, coherent, um, enclosed entity. Um, and so for me, the concept of the, the self-fashion or the self-create is already a misnomer because the thing that I'm actually um, most bothered by in that is the self part. Um, you know, it's, it's it's interesting that we talk about being selfless as like a thing that one should desire, um, and yet the word selfless means that one is constantly in the sort of state of outpouring, um, the state of unfolding, the state of give, um, the state of constant sort of capacity, as opposed to, you know, if you're if you're full of yourself, like it's it's weird. Like our language already says you're full of yourself, right? But then it's like, if you're full of yourself is the bad thing, right? Then to be a, a self-fashioner in that certain kind of way seems to be to go against the, I'm trying to interrogate what it means then to have a self. And so I think that even when people are singing, right, that what they are actually doing is in the process of composition that is ne- that is necessarily improvisational, which is necessarily collective, um, even if one is in the room by, one, by oneself. That... What one is constantly doing with whatever sort of music they are creating, with whatever sound that they are creating, is commenting on the things that have happened before and the things that are to come. Um, there is no original performance of anything. There, every performance is, a, is the riff on the performances that have already happened, right? And so it's always about, or so relation is fundamental. Relation is originary. If relation is originary, vibration is originary, that what what is originary is multiplicity, right? And so even if one is sort of creating music on one's own, what one is really doing is really creating through the practice of improvisation, um, which necessitates a collective. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm trying to think about... Um, and interrogate the concept of the self. 
uh, even if that, even if the thing that we call the self exists in solitude. I mean, I live in, alone in California. I don't leave my house most of the time during the day because it's too hot. Um, and so I exist in solitude a lot, right? But my friends call me all the time to make sure I'm okay, right? And that is that is important because they know that I am kind of depressed about living in California. And so that knowledge produces a different occasion for out for extending outward and for reaching out and for producing relations. Um, and yeah, so thank you. Uh, the the room and the room. I have one more question. Yeah, I'm so much of question. So, yeah, you would do that, right? Yeah, I just told Sean that's no, I'm not going to speak up. Listen, when you talk about the terms of the vibration of the universe, you say that she will. Uh, <laughs> so my name is Michael Robbins. I have a comment, and, and a great comment, particularly in that which you laid out. Uh, uh, Thank I'm you. I'm not from Brooklyn, New York, as you kind of tell. And, uh, <laughs> this notion of performance, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madonna, Washington, Madonna, and all this other stuff. As a black trans woman in theological discourse emerging out of the, the, the uh, great migration of African Americans moving from the South to the North and Harlem becoming this black woman. And that in this space, black church, particularly Abyssinian black and Baptist church, created a three decade campaign to get rid of black queers out of Harlem and black trans women created a drag ball circuit that becomes not only the political space, but the theological. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then it the migrates after World War II to other cities that became black. And then, in that sense, it is to me as a freedom movement across the yeah. over the system of oppression. But then, politically, it makes a decision in 67 to move from drag ball to house ball. One introduces patriarchy, but responds to the 1969s to Wall and all this stuff. Um, and so, I like exactly what you're saying, particularly also because. This thing around this sort of vibration and, and uh, uh, this vibrational conversation, think about the, the notion of Vogue <coughs> using Vogue to yeah. contextualize its sort of its struggle, its pain. At the same time, in LA, Tom Proctor creates um, black. So here are two black, two black men creating a dance move, a performance, not knowing. Mm -hmm. Not in conversation, but something I call the black ontology, right? Mm -hmm. Something ontological around blackness that in, in the midst of, <coughs> at the point of elimination, creates a space, a space that is not only sort of the notion of philosophy, learning how to die, the theology of rebirth, right? Yeah. And that's the question that Ella Baker talks about politically, who are my people? Mm -hmm. So I just say that to say thank you for all of this. It was wonderful. <laughs> thank you.